Um, and hello, everybody. I hope you um, uh, don't mind. I've, I've turned video on. I hope that doesn't scare anybody. Um, I'd love to take questions, um, and I'm happy to kind of take questions um, uh, throughout. Uh, so if you feel like um, uh, uh, stopping me at some point uh, for clarification or, or to just ask a general question, feel free to raise your hand, and I'll do my best to, to get to those questions. Um, as Kirthana pointed out, I've spent uh, um, over 30 years, uh, most of it on the delivery side, meaning building, uh, deploying, and operating infrastructure, uh, everything from uh, local area networks and support desks through to entire data centers and global networks uh, and even cloud infrastructure. And um, I've spent time on the um, other side of the coin as well. Uh, obviously, I'm doing that now with my own company, um, helping to sell some of those technologies, helping to sell data center, helping to sell tools like container management platforms and cloud management platforms, et cetera, and helping to build those companies. Um, and you know, today, what I'm hoping to impart, um, uh, while with a security theme, uh, you could argue that most of my conversation um, can be applied to almost any technology area uh, or service area within the technology industry. And um, it's more about uh, awareness, right? Keeping an eye on um, what's happening around to around you and what's happening with adoption, so that you have a better idea for how your skill set. Um, and the demands um, on your service or your um, production, whatever it may be, whether your production is uh, serving in a help desk or your production is, is being the CISO at a um, enterprise um, or something in between, sorry. Um, what, uh, you know, what should you do to adapt to those technology trends uh, and be prepared? And so hopefully that comes through um, uh, this uh, uh, deck certainly isn't meant to be an educational deck. Uh, so um, if there is anything of educational value, uh, it might be pointers on the deck and the rest of it, I hope, uh, will come from me. So uh, let's get started. Let's assume that uh, more security equals uh, reduced usability, right? I mean, that's a, as a, as a practitioner and a, and a user and a, and um, uh, a leader in any company, um, this is fairly common assumption is that if we put more security on something, that means that it's going to be harder to use or be less fun to use. Um, and I, I would put on the audience here, uh, is that true? Um, and does it have to be true? Uh, and I would argue that um, it doesn't have to be, right? And so when you when you consider um, security in general, I don't I don't see how you can separate the ability to ensure it's used successfully from meaning it actually provides some level of security uh, uh, benefit um, with the simplicity of it being used. Whether that simplicity is through transparency whether that simplicity is through uh, just ease of action of the person um, using an application or sharing data or whatever the case may be um, is almost immaterial. But the, the fact is, is that if you make it easier to use and easier to consume, it's more likely to be used the way you intended it to be used. So just uh, the next few slides are just some highlights of of you know, kind of the impact or the outcomes of some of the trends that are occurring right now. And so this one might be directly related uh, almost exclusively to the COVID uh, pandemic. And um, fairly startling number that uh, 25 to 30% of the workforce uh, will be working from home multiple days a week by the end of 2021. And out of, within that number, is it 50% number, 25% of the, I don't know, but some major portion of the workforce will likely be working from home or working from anywhere. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean for, by working from anywhere and why that might be different from working from home. But it's, a, it's an important consideration to make because you're not, it's, it's historically been untrue that just creating strong border protection with a firewall and um, some sort of security software on your clients, uh, it's always been untrue that that um, but that, that traditional boundary is uh, a safety blanket, for lack of a better description, for most of us, especially those of us who are attempting to do security and had no um, 
no reason to have anyone believe we should be doing security. And that was very common up until 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, I was tasked with running the security for several large firms, including a company called Gilead in Foster City, which many of you may be familiar with. They're one of the, one of the largest um, um, drug companies on the market today. Um, and, um, and that's completely inappropriate. I knew, I mean, comparative to somebody that's actually gone to school for security, I knew almost nothing. Um, and responsible for what considered to be kind of the border protection um, for security and for data protection, et cetera, et cetera. So another um, kind of interesting stat is that 44% of CEO respondents rank data privacy among the top three policies most impactful to the business. So why is that important? It's important because um, uh, the creation of data is only accelerating. And to give you an example, um, uh, Gartner uh, made a prediction in, uh, I think it was 2018, um, might have been 19, but somewhere around 2018 or 19, uh, they made a prediction that by 2025, 75% of the data created in that calendar year would be created outside of the on-premises or cloud data center. So what exactly does that mean? Well, that means that it's not in, in your hands. You can't go hug um, your servers and your storage devices. You can't go look at the data center and sigh a breath of relief that the doors are still locked and the power's still on. And, and as far as you know, nobody's plugged a USB stick with a, with a radio on it to, um, into your data center and you're safe um, in theory, right? Um, but to think that 75% of the data, and again, that doesn't mean that if we create 100 gigs of data, 100 zettabytes, whatever the number you wanna pick, it doesn't mean that if we create 100 zettabytes, zettabytes today, that we're only creating 100 zettabytes in 2025 and 75% of those are um, quote unquote at the edge outside of uh, on-premises and cloud data centers. But what it means is that that 100 zettabytes we have today is gonna continue to grow at somewhere between a compounded annual rate of 35 and 45% per annum. And, and whatever that new number is, if that's, 300 zettabytes in 2025, that means 900 additional zettabytes will be created in new places. And those places will need to be able to be secured um, or they'll need to be able to be designed so that the data doesn't um, cause disruption to the business when it's stolen or the devices collecting the data aren't fooled into telling the owners of that environment something that they um, uh, believe is true when it's not. And that could be almost anything. Interesting impact statement, right? So the pandemic um, boosts automation, it boosts robotics. I already mentioned uh, the notion associated with working from home or working from anywhere. Um, but I've got one link here, but you could find um, literally hundreds of stories in premium news outlets talking about uh, and with analyst firms about the impact the pandemic has had on increasing use of automation, um, re re increasing the use of robotics, um, and uh, trying to find ways to get the human in effect, whether it involves one of those two things or not, trying to find ways to get the human out of the process. And so when you think about security and you think about things like DevOps and how it applies to the delivery of new applications, how DevOps might even apply to um, uh, the culture within an organization and being able to deliver anything more efficiently and more consistently um, using those kinds of theories for getting more done with less people um, with better consistency is a premium opportunity for almost any enterprise. And coming in with that mindset will be appreciated. And I can tell you, um, yes, I'm a CEO, but I'm a CEO for a tiny organization. Uh, so let's not, uh, you know, take that any farther than it's worth. I'm, I'm a nobody, virtually speaking. Um, but if I'm the CEO for, for Citrix, or I'm the CEO for GE, or I'm the CEO for Walmart, uh, and I came in after the shutdown notice came out uh, for my state, my country, my region, whatever, and I sat around the virtual table with the other execs in the company, the first thing I would ask everyone in the room is, what's our constraint? Why aren't we shipping? Why aren't we building? Uh, why aren't we answering phones? Why aren't people in the office? Whatever the case may be, because things aren't getting done. And the simple answer to that question is, people are our constraint. And that doesn't, that doesn't have to sound good. 
doesn't have to sound bad. It just is. And so when, when you think about delivering IT solutions, whether it's security specific or, or a, a technology in general, you'll, you'll want to find ways to keep that in mind for how it can be delivered, how it can be managed going forward uh, and how it can be managed with the least amount of human touch because human touch means interruption. It either means that you have to send somebody into the data center. It means that they have to be not sick to support what's going on or it means they have to be involved in the process of fixing it more than they uh, um, absolutely have to be. Any one of those things potentially means interruption. So major trends, right? So these are some of the trends that are affecting the technology trends or technology developments that occur um, across industry, across the world. So customer engagement, what exactly do I mean by that? Well, um, I would argue that this may be one of the single most important, if not these most important trends in enterprise. And because almost all of the subtrends to this, digital transformation, automation, um, faster turns on data, better privacy protection of data, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things are meant to satisfy the urge and the desire and the demand to have a better relationship and better engagement with the customer. And truthfully, customer engagement is an enormous opportunity area for any business to differentiate themselves from others. So um, when you think about um, what you're deploying or how you're referencing a product or a service, keep that in mind. And, and also I would argue, uh, especially for those of you in leadership roles or trying to get into leadership roles, um, don't think about customer engagement as just the external customer that's buying your paper towels or buying your jet engines. Um, think about the customer as the employee. And if the employee is getting what they need and if they're satisfied with the tools they're using and if they're engaged and you're engaged with them as a company, then they're gonna be happier, they're gonna be more productive. If they're happy and more productive, they're gonna drive down your cost of operations and drive up quality of deliverables and they're gonna make the external customer happier. It just is. And so I would highly urge that may not be something that every leader you talk to today, or every manager you might come in contact with agrees with or uh, expects, but um, it's my recommendation that you keep that in your back pocket regardless. The citizen developer, right? What is that? Well, um, I don't spend a lot of time talking about this in the presentation. Um, happy to answer questions later um, if, if I can. I'm not a developer by trade. I haven't um, coded anything outside of a classroom in, in 20 plus years. Um, I've been more of an infrastructure geek, uh, more of a strategy wonk, whatever you wanna call it. Um, but the citizen developer introduces a whole new opportunity and risk vector for the technology space. I mean, just think about, you know, an easy, an easy correlation is um, I've got an IT organization and as an IT leader, I am responsible for the applications that the company uses and I'm responsible for securing them. I'm, re I'm responsible for getting value out of them. I'm responsible for making sure that the um, applications are designed around supporting what the customers actually want. Uh, I'm responsible for making sure that between applications, I'm sharing data and not creating silos where I don't have to, to maximize the value of the overall environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, SaaS comes out, right? SaaS is a great thing. Wow, that's awesome. Kirthana can go out and buy a Salesforce on her own without even talking to IT. She can, right? In many organizations, there's nothing technical that would stop her from doing that. Um, the problem is, is that if she introduces um, uh, Salesforce, who in the team that works with her is responsible for ensuring that uh, um, access privileges are given to the right people? Who's responsible for ensuring that those privileges are managed? Who's responsible for ensuring that those privileges are removed when that person leaves the company? Who's responsible for maintaining training? Who's responsible for um, determining what value might be being created in Salesforce and pick any one of 20 different software as a service applications that are available today? Who's responsible within Kirthana's organization for determining whether or not what's being created there is um, being 
shared appropriately with other organizations that might benefit from that data and vice versa. Now, take that so, um, and magnify that. I'm sorry, go ahead. So I actually want to know who's responsible. Who's responsible for that uh, solution? Yeah. Yeah, and so the, the simple answer is that creates what uh, is euphemistically called shadow IT. Shadow IT, yeah. Right. And, and, and I, you know, uh, that's a whole nother topic that I'd be happy to talk about, but um, I'd use the rest of the presentation if I, if you guys allowed me to get involved in talking about shadow IT, but shadow IT in effect is an organization that believes they have a problem that the normal IT organization isn't ready or willing to solve and they need to solve it and they want to solve it, or they're just doing a power grab could be any one of those things. And they go out and they create IT solutions independent of the IT organization. So SaaS, as you might imagine, magnifies that opportunity exponentially because it's so much easier to adopt a technology. Now, take into account the potential for citizen developers using things like no code or low code. Now, all of a sudden, you've got any number of people in an organization that have five minutes of technology background trying to develop applications that link into the ERP app or that um, are, are trying to leverage some data being created in another application in some other part of the company or are just a unique application that are created and who's governing security? Who's governing tools that are brought in to enable that platform and their licensing? Who's authorizing access? Um, and so the, these are real problems that um, the, the more involved an IT organization is, the more involved uh, a security representative to the IT organization or to the business as a, whole, as a whole is involved in, the more likely you are to be in front of this problem. And it's not about saying no to people. It's about helping them understand the best way to benefit from these technologies and tools without putting the company at risk. Mm -hmm. uh, efficiency, resiliency, remote work. I talked a little bit about that. All three of these are major areas of opportunity associated with what's going on today. And, and efficiency and resiliency, efficiency uh, is, is a no brainer, right? But uh, the difference is what technologies are being brought to bear now that are having a bigger impact on efficiency. Historically, it's been, you know, process improvement, applying software where there wasn't any, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that is still true but many of the solutions that are being implemented to allow for greater efficiency also introduce a, tr a significant amount of new vectors of risk opportunity for a business. Like every single endpoint for, an IO for IoT devices as a simple example. So let me see here. Just making sure I'm not missing anything. Yep, okay, good. That was just Krithana, thank you Krithana. Um, resiliency. Um, when you think about resiliency, uh, you, again, I think you have to um, put a number of hats on, but certainly um, the hat associated with the pandemic uh, is really important because resiliency is no longer about building two data centers when you really need one. It's no longer about building um, uh, uh, double stacks of hardware clusters everywhere where you build um, infrastructure for an application. It's more about the resiliency of more effectively designing the application for the environment, and this definitely includes security, um, and for how that application benefits from and uses a distributed set of infrastructure, as that's becoming more and more the norm as people, as I mentioned earlier, relative to data creation, um, if more and more of that data is gonna be created outside the data center, that means more and more applications and infrastructure are gonna be outside the common data center and the, and the cloud data center. And so how do we apply resiliency to that without overbuilding the, the opportunity? So major trust trends from a customer engagement standpoint. So these are, you know, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but these are the kind of the areas of opportunity at, at the highest level. There are probably another dozen that you could think up if you really worked at it. But from a loyalty standpoint is how can I engage with a customer more effectively so that they see me as a partner and a friend rather than someone creeping through their bedroom window. Um, uh, how do they, how, how, do, how are my responses uh, more in line with, with their day-to-day -day activities and, and their day-to-day -day demands on the product or service um, that I offer? 
Those are things that engender loyalty. And of course, not uh, giving up someone's private information is a good way to maintain their loyalty. Um, interactions, right? So what, what kind of interactions? Well, if you think about um, apply edge computing um, to what we're doing and what, we're, what is traditional, um, the traditional enterprise is very much um, like a body with no arms and, and hands. I think of the corporate body as, as, as just a large, big building, as an, as an example. And, uh, or maybe the body is a better example. Uh, so think of the, the corporate entity as a body with no arms and no hands. What's the importance of arms and hands? Obviously, you pick up things, you move things, you, you hold on to things, you maintain your balance, you put your clothes on, you eat. You know, all those things are important, yes. But specifically, when I'm talking about it relative to technology trends and the corporate, is that... The technologies that we've used historically, like uh, phone trees and flat web pages and email uh, bombing and spamming, et cetera, et cetera, are all very traditional. And they are, um, for lack of a better description, not differentiating, right? And I'm being kind. Why are harm, arms and hands important then? What do they bring? Well, what is an arm and hand, right? I mean. Um, we don't get to see people very often anymore, but certainly there are a lot of people I can think of that if I could see them, I'd want to shake their hand or give them a hug. I mean, I'm just being open. I mean, it's been, I travel a lot. I have lots of friends. I have lots of family. Um, and uh, the idea of, of being able to engage at some level by, by physical touch through a handshake or hug is very important to humans. And it's important because a simple handshake or a hug can convey friendship. It can convey strength and loyalty and trust and many other normal human feelings. And what the opportunity for the enterprise is, is to use the tools that are becoming available today through edge computing, et cetera, et cetera, to become those hands and arms for the corporate body. So um, yes. I have a question. It's kind of related to COVID-19. Yes, so um, COVID-19 yes. will change, like no one's gonna give a handshake or hug people. So how will you build up loyalty like from now onwards? If there's no like human Well, touch? I think, yeah, Kirtana, I mean, that, that again, that's a whole nother conversation about the long-term uh, impact on human um, interaction based on things like COVID and, and you know, potential future pandemics. Um, but it doesn't, what it doesn't do is it doesn't change. And in fact, it exacerbates the need for enterprises to put solutions in place that can replace the traditional handshake and, and smile and eye wink and hug, et cetera, et cetera, right? And edge computing um, by and large helps to offer some of those opportunities. So I think to your point, I actually think that's one of the reasons why technology at the edge is likely to further accelerate over the next couple of years. Um, because it will provide a replacement for the flat website, the phone tree, or the ability for a salesperson or, you know, a local representative to come up and shake your hand and wink and hug and, and laugh and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and, so there's some, sorry. No problem. There's some other question from the chat. Yes. Um, so Elnas asked that the owners of businesses do not have technical knowledge how we can make our explanation simple and understandable for them to convince them not to have security? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and unfortunately in the security space, one of the hardest ones, uh, well, I'm gonna say something to you that to all of you that you probably don't wanna hear. And that is that um, everybody talks about the importance of security, um, but few people actually act on it the way they need to. And when they do act on it, it tends to be after they've already had a knife stuck in their ribs. Right. Oh, now it's a good idea to know where a doctor is um, because I've got a knife in my ribs. Um, and so that's that's just the truth. But I, I don't, unfortunately, I mean, I, I, I as, as a human, I am driven by wanting to give people answers to the questions that they have. I don't have a great answer for you other than to say that like Einstein's quote, and I apologize if I paraphrase it and don't get it exactly right, but basically Einstein's quote was, if you really know your subject, you can explain it to a three-year-old, right? And so that's, that's the best way that I can argue for trying to get that security message across is mm -hmm. don't 
don't talk about far off things like the UN said this or the federal government said that or a company that doesn't even look the same as yours got into trouble because of this and, and assume that your audience will relate what you're saying and the, the abstraction within each one of those areas of opportunity and relate it to them. So you, beyond what I've already said, your next best thing is after simplification is finding a way to directly relate it to them. So I, I did a nasty trick one time and I got lucky and I did it because I knew the leadership team. Uh, and this in fact, this was at Gilead, uh, a, a company I've already mentioned. Um, and I was in a, at a, in a meeting with a significant portion of the executive staff uh, and my boss, the CEO, or excuse me, the CIO, um, and I was asked to talk about security. And, I, you know, again, I'm a neophyte. I probably don't know half as much as anybody else uh, on the um, Zoom. To the, um, but I went in and I thought, okay, I've already struggled with trying to get people to understand security, to, to do simple things like lock their client when they leave and not let their family use their client and, and, and uh, uh, put appropriate designation on documents and so on and so on and so on. But I thought, I got to do something that drives it home. So I was actually in the meeting and I had one of my employees hack the, um, the uh, COO's laptop in the meeting and change an email that they were working on. And um, this is not a person who was able to get access because they had um, privileges this was a person who was able to find ways to hack in because of the security cracks that I believed we needed to fix. And um, it sent a very strong message, but again, that kind of play can be really dangerous. And um, uh, you know, a, a personal bit of advice from, from the hard-headed Mark Teeley um, is that I tend to just want to say what is I want to say there's an elephant on the table. I don't want to talk around the elephant. I want to say there's an elephant on the table. Why aren't we talking about the elephant? That's my nature. But that can be a dangerous way to get your boss's attention, right? Nobody likes to be embarrassed. And so what I did, I did under the pretext that I was going to be protected by my CIO and I knew the COO well enough to think that I could get myself out of trouble with her. So. That being said, um, I would say that, you know, if you have something that really must be said, um, find a private way to say it first, if it might embarrass somebody. Um, and if that doesn't work, then, well, uh, you know, you have to do what you have to do to try to get the right message across. So uh, customer engagement, right? Business and, and technology subtrends, right? So we've been talking a lot about customer engagement and, um, uh, business transformation, uh, I call it business transformation, it is more normally understood as digital transformation, um, is, is a huge subtrend of customer engagement and efficiency and agility in businesses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, within that framework, what I would suggest is understanding what um, a digital transformation vision might be, thinking it through, even reading um, if you can find, read some visions for what companies expect from themselves as they transform. And, and keep in mind also that transformation is a journey. You don't just get to transformation and boom, you're done, right? Transformation is always an opportunity. So it, it becomes more like a lifestyle. It's more like applying a, 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 a combination of agility and DevOps and process thinking or design thinking um, uh, and apply it to every organization within your company. Right, it, that doesn't stop. It's not like you finished DevOpsing; um, you continue to DevOps. Uh, and so, digital transformation is the same way. How can what you do? Pardon me. How can what you do help simplify that process? Help help the um, the customer, your business in this case, your consulting client, whatever it may be, better visualize that future with the appropriate type of security integrated in from the beginning. Right? Because what obviously doesn't work, and you probably all know this already, but what generally or most almost always never works is attempting to apply security after the fact. 
get it in as early as you can. Get it in in, in early as you can in, in designing um, how the data should be considered that's going to be collected, who's going to be using the platform, how the application is likely to work, how integrations are likely to work, et cetera, et cetera. And then how that will be managed, how that will be change managed through automated processes as the company continues to grow and expand. Edge computing, we've talked about to, uh, to some degree, but um, I'll add a couple more points here. I mean, edge computing um, uh, will mean, first of all, means a lot of things to a lot of different people. And it's, it's literally what I do uh, on an all, all day basis uh, and have been for most of the last five years. So if anybody's interested in, in just poking around more about edge computing, feel free to reach out to me via email or, or LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever. I'm happy to engage in that conversation. But edge computing um, in the simplest form is an economic opportunity model, right? And what, what does Mark mean by that? Well, um, when we put solutions in place today, every one of the solutions that we put in place, every technology solution is incorporated and built around the knowledge that I can put this much and this type of storage and this much and this type of CPU and this much and this type of network and this much and this type of software based on what my audience is, how they're gonna use the platform, how they'll benefit from, from it and therefore how much they're willing to pay for it. Even if it's an internal application, that model still applies. So within that framework, you can't just say, well, I need to deliver uh, lunch updates to the customers throughout the company. So I'm gonna buy a Cray system, right? Can't do that. That doesn't make any sense at all. Um, it doesn't make sense that if you're gonna deliver Citrix remote clients to uh, employees or students around the world um, that you buy a hundred gigs of bandwidth to everyone's home. The whole point of Citrix is they don't use much bandwidth. So every application that you deliver is constrained by what makes sense within the value of the money you're spending for the tools you're getting uh, and, and the associated ROI. Edge computing is no different, right? So from an edge standpoint, my simple definition outside of a technical definition is that edge is where the economics in combination with desire and opportunity meet to create a new delivery or solution option, right? So for instance, you could be delivering a really cool website today, really, really cool website, but everything's great about it. But if customers are more than 500 miles away from where that, that website is hosted, the performance sucks. Still a really cool website, but it takes seconds or minutes to download or, and, and update or cycle or, or display properly, whatever the case may be. But because of the potential customer differentiation of using that application with better performance, you decide to move it closer to the edge and put it in an edge data center or a set of edge data centers uh, in cities around the world because this is a major opportunity for customer engagement and differentiation of that customer relationship for your business. Well, in that model, the obvious opportunity for you is to say, how many customers are likely to benefit from this change? What kind of differentiation will this make versus my competitor? So will this attract new customers? And when I add all that up, what's that value versus the cost of me putting that application closer to the customers? Depending on what that cost is, I can put that solution out to more people in more locations or fewer people. It's purely an economic decision. And edge computing is that combined with that desire that we talked about earlier in the presentation about companies wanting to be able to be more engaged with their customers. So there's a stronger desire to be closer to the customer, still within the framework of cost and opportunity. And there's the pure uh, 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 fact that it doesn't matter whether we like it or not, which is that a majority of applications, maybe I shouldn't say the majority, I don't know that that's true a large proportion of applications at the edge are likely to create more data than they can successfully put somewhere else and still support the customer demand at the edge. So in other words, if the data is being, if the people are creating data, the machines, the IOT devices, or some combination of the above are creating data somewhere at the edge, 
chances are they're going to be creating so much data that that data is only going to be useful from an application and benefit delivery model by having it stay there and utilized right there. So again, what's that cost opportunity? And is it more expensive to, to buy more bandwidth and try to centralize to that to the cloud? Is it cheaper to try and keep it local? Um, are there differentiation benefits because we keep it local that might also add value? Anyway, you get the idea. And of course, business agility. And business agility ties in um, very much with uh, digital transformation and edge computing. And, and you know, one of the examples I like to give when I'm doing talks um, that involve the discussion around agility um, and digital transformation is that I ask practitioners, other folks that have a history similar to mine at some level, I ask them in the audience, I say, how many of you have been asked by your leadership to supply real-time data? And I don't mean real-time data like, uh, are all the servers running or is the temperature in the data center proper or something like that? I mean, real-time data on what customers are doing, how they're using our product, um, how a service is operating, et cetera, customer comments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And almost every single practitioner raises their hand. Yep, I've been asked to do that. And then I ask the next question, which is, okay, so you've been asked to provide real-time data. How many times have you been able, or how, how many times has your leadership actually acted in real time on your real-time data. Almost every single time, nobody raises their hand. So again, everybody says they want real-time data. Nobody's actually doing it. And that's where digital transformation and edge computing, edge computing is more of a feeder into that. If you're doing edge computing and you're not doing real-time response to customers, you might as well just shoot yourself in the head right now. Just go home, shoot yourself in the head, forget about it. Um, and business agility is, is just all wrapped up in there. When the better you can turn on information, whether that information is machine driven or that information is human driven or some combination of the above, the better you can turn on that data, the better your business will be. And security has for so many reasons, a huge part to play in both enabling that and protecting it so that the business is turning on data that they can trust at a minimum. So major trends in efficiency. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time here. Uh, I want to leave a little bit of time if you guys have some questions. So I'm going to, you know, kind of uh, spend a little bit less time on some of the subsequent slides. But automation, drones, robotics, connected and autonomous vehicles, AR, VR, AI, all of these things are both um, enablers of and benefactors of um, things like edge computing and the desire for um, uh, uh, you know, more efficiency, uh, uh, better speed, better information, et cetera, et cetera. But all of them come with their own security challenges. Um, in some cases, uh, they can be used to help enable security. I mean, you might argue that when uh, some businesses have serious uh, theft problems or they have serious um, injury or illness problems, that robotics is actually a security improvement. Right. I mean, it's just but robotics, again, potentially has its own security threat as well that you need to mitigate. But nonetheless, overall, you might be able to argue that, re that robotics is actually a security improvement. Um, drones, um, you know, I mean, we've all seen the movies. Well, I, I like stupid action movies uh, sometimes. So maybe you guys haven't seen those movies and I have. But drones are commonly taken over and used for dastardly deeds. Um, and so, you know, people believe that's true and it could be true. I don't know. I'm not enough to take over a drone and make it do something it's not supposed to do. Um, but these are technologies that are being driven uh, by demand, by digital transformation, by, by automation, um, by the desire to, to, um, to reduce the, the, to reach more customers with fewer people, effectively using Google's SRE theme of 50% improvement year over year and use it against people in your organization for almost every function, drones and robotics, et cetera, et cetera, fit right into that. Um, connected and autonomous vehicles, this is, this is huge, right? I mean, uh, in a, in a medium sized city, uh, somebody manipulating um, the assumptions cars are making, making based on their connections to systems distributed throughout a city 
um, uh, changes to that information or incorrect information being shared or the information being blocked for just a period of time has the potential to shut down a city, right? So, uh, and I'm gonna just skip forward here and, and we'll get to uh, what I mean by potentially shutting down a city and, and how that's related to when you enable a service, it becomes kind of a requirement. Um, DevOps, I'm sure you guys have all heard about this. I'm sure everyone's heard about DevSecOps. I don't know if everybody believes in DevSecOps, but the theory is good. Um, and I believe in the desire to get there. And that's the ability to apply security um, in real time and changes to environments and ensure that the security theme, compliance themes, et cetera, are always applied um, regardless of the speed of delivery and organization, right? If you want to maintain a, a seat at the table, then you have to show that you're solving problems, but you're not getting in the way of progress. And that's the hard part that we play in the technology space. Um, like for me, I've done more disaster recovery and avoidance uh, planning efforts than I've done large scale security efforts. And I can tell you that every business after a hurricane, after a tidal wave, after an earthquake knows they need disaster recovery and, and planning. Um, before that, they don't. Even if they do, they don't want to accept that notion. And if they did, they would spend more time on it. Um, but what they, they want from me as the practitioner is to help them attain that without interrupting operations, right? Because to them, um, yes, disaster avoidance for something that might happen or may not happen is interesting. And it is interesting. Beyond that, it's nothing. It's just interesting that, yes, if I let Mark buy that redundant data center, then I'm protected the next time California has an earthquake. And that assumes that not only do we have an earthquake, but that earthquake directly impacts my ability to operate in this particular location. So let's, that's interesting. But what's more important is I'm selling like I can't freaking print checks fast enough. I can't spend the money fast enough. I'm selling so much, we're so busy. So if I take people and distract them from their activity of selling product, how, whatever part of that, of that process they play in, or as an executive's admin or a, an engineer or a, a maintenance worker or a salesperson or somebody in between, if I'm delaying their ability to deliver what the company is building, that's real. That's not interesting. That's real. That's potentially lost opportunity right there, real time, right in front of us. And so when you portray what you're trying to do to the business, you have to keep that kind of thing in mind. What is to you the equivalent of, wait a minute, you just said no to breathing. That's how you feel when you try to convince somebody that they should execute on a security project that you've identified or any solution or project that you've identified is important. It's like, what are you talking about? You don't want to breathe? That's how obvious it is to you. But to them, it's very different, right? And so use, use this um, as uh, some additional advice in how you approach people, recognizing that um, they have a significant number of other um, threats to their success and to the company's success. And um, uh, they're, they, they, they don't think of those as interesting. They think of those as bread and butter. Like if as, as serious as you think of security, they think I need to get that 101 uh, uh, first widget out the door today or whatever the equivalent is. So major trends in resiliency, uh, you know, offering services at the edge. Uh, I talked about this a little bit, so I won't spend a lot of time on this slide but um, more and more services will be offered at the edge. And, and um, when you think about the edge or when you think about the pandemic and its impact on technology adoption, um, realize that yesterday, i.e. before the block, uh, before the pandemic, um, before um, people started really thinking about what 5G might do or how IoT devices might uh, help uh, uh, enable new capabilities at the edge or how AR and VR might save a company millions of dollars a year just in the need to, um, to uh, where they can avoid uh, centralizing training and they can do training at remote sites because they're using AR and VR. It could be as simple as that, um, is that this creates a, an entirely new set of vectors for risk and threat 
and um, needs to be considered in, in how you think about security um, and how you enable security so that it's not a blocker, um, but it is there. And so again, convincing, uh, and this is something you should ask during interviews, right? Don't, don't let yourself be surprised later. Don't assume you're gonna make your girlfriend or boyfriend change their mind. Um, uh, find out ahead of time. And if you don't believe that the theory and philosophy and culture of the organization you're going to supports the idea of doing things um, with, with systema, systema, systemic approach of inclusion at the very beginning, then maybe that's not the right place to go to work. Major trends in resiliency. Um, you know, the, this is what I was talking about earlier. And this is, this is this kind of the stupidest thing I've probably ever put in a slide only because I'm, I'm playing around with the idea that this is Mark's law. Um, and it's probably been said a hundred different ways by other people. And I'm just trying to coin it because I've not personally seen it. But the basic idea is whether you're thinking about edge or whether you're thinking about a new service that the company is delivering somewhere, you have to realize that like the autonomous vehicle um, uh, analogy or discussion I was having on a previous slide is that if today people are driving through the city without any kind of autonomous capability, any kind of uh, connected car capability to avoid accidents, to avoid sh road shutdowns, to, to reduce uh, traffic issues, et cetera, et cetera, then people live and breathe understanding that that's how it is. But if that same city converts to where some of those things are now assumed to be managed and protected for you, it doesn't take very long before that capability is assumed. And when it's not there, everything stops, right? So um, how many of you have ever, uh, and, and you don't have to answer this, I'll just ask, but I mean, if you feel like answering, feel free. But how many of you have um, planned a road trip actually using a physical map? Right? How many of you have um, planned meeting your friends or your parents at the mall, as an example, by saying, okay, well, I'll meet you exactly at three in front of the Starbucks that's across from Nordstrom's? Right? That's how I used to do it as a kid, even as a young adult. Now, if I try to tell my daughter, or when I'm not thinking, my daughter, hey, I'd like to meet you, you know, at, at, at three o'clock in front of the Nordstrom, she's like, just text me. And so why is that important? It's a, it's a little tiny, tiny indicator that is anywhere near as serious as the idea of the autonomous vehicle, where as people get used to this, they literally forget how to do it any other way. And it doesn't take very long. And when you think about the time it takes to, to manage in a, a, a automobiles um, uh, uh, and screw that up in a fast moving city, then your ability to, to switch back to the way you did it six months or six years ago is almost non-existent as far as being really useful. It's like, how many times have you been at a four-way stop and um, uh, found out, wow, people don't actually know how to use four-way stop anymore it's when that particular intersection has always been a normal traffic light and now it's flashing red and somehow people forget how to do that, allow car to go first, et cetera, et cetera. When you, when you think about all the services that are going to be enabled and how secure plays with them, resiliency becomes really important. Resiliency and independence becomes really important. Because once you turn things on for people, whether it's efficiency in a store, uh, experience in a store, how inventory is managed in a store, how automobile uh, uh, traffic patterns are planned, anything like that, once you turn it on, it's almost impossible to turn it off. So resiliency in design becomes incredibly important. And here, hence, my no good deed goes unpunished because you think you're being a good gal, a good man, a good woman, whatever the case may be, by giving somebody something that you don't have to give them, but you were able, and then you find out, oh crap, 
two weeks later, two months later, it's not a, a, a nice to have anymore. It's just a minimum requirement that you have to figure out how to support. Work from anywhere. Um, why is this different, right? Well, historically working from home, even schooling from home meant that you lived minutes from school or 30 minutes from your office. And when you didn't work from home, you worked in the office. And what happens if the office isn't there anymore? Twitter, uh, um, a, a couple of other companies whose names I can't remember off the top of my head, just in Silicon Valley, where I'm very familiar. I've spent 35 years living in Silicon Valley. Um, they, their offices are gonna be closed. So if I lived in Fremont, California, 30 minutes away from the Menlo Park office of Twitter or wherever the office is, I'm not working from home anymore. I'm literally working from anywhere. And I could potentially move to Boulder, Colorado or Bali, Indonesia, as long as I can get my work done. That being said, that as long as I can get my work done has a set of responsibilities that aren't just the users, but they're people that deliver the technology for that user to be successful, that customer, that internal customer to be successful. And security plays a huge part in that because if I'm in Bali, and I've got to authenticate in the Google cloud that is all the way over in Singapore or Australia, or for even worse, back in California in zone, in zone one West or whatever they call it. Um, that's a huge problem as far as my performance and my success in working from anywhere. And so when you, when you think about working from anywhere, you have to try to figure out how to look at complete independence married to ways to solve traditional problems in new ways, like putting the security and the authentication uh, associated with it, uh, accounting, authentication, authorization, et cetera, et cetera, all as close to the customer as possible because they can be huge detractors in localized performance. Technology to survive, um, we, we've talked about this, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but basically, um, we are getting more and more to the point where um, a kid that is born today or even a kid that was born five or six years ago won't know how to start a fire, won't know how to do their schoolwork, won't even know how to get to school, um, won't know how to drive a car, uh, won't know how to fix a flat, um, won't know how to do any of those things without access to their smartphone or some other local technology. And so, um, back to my point about resiliency, uh, this becomes a critical aspect of, of how the world survives and how technology uh, performance and, and usability is, is um, prioritized um, because it, that's a real, it's a real thing. It's, it's something that needs to be considered. Lower latency and customer experience. We talked about this a little bit already relative to Bali. Um, there, and if you're interested, I have a... Um, a couple of links here. Again, I'll, I'll send the presentation to, to um, Kirthana so that she can uh, share it. Um, and you can take a look at some of these links for further information. But like um, the IEEE example is just a great example of thinking about security more localized. And ORT, uh, and I'm not trying to pick on any particular company, I just picked on them because I happen to know them, is trying to solve um, low latency security by taking it out of um, traditional public cloud authorization process and putting it closer to the customer. So these are just great examples uh, to take a look at. Data creation and protection for IoT. Um, so we talked about data creation and the potential volume, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Jevons Paradox. If you're not familiar with Jevons Paradox, I would urge you to once, once um, exams are finished and you feel like you're okay with doing something that approaches work again, um, whatever that is, whether that's two years from now or two days from now, um, look up Jevons Paradox, spend five minutes reading about Jevons Paradox on Wikipedia um, because it, it will help you think about how technology is adopted and how when barriers to acquisition and barriers to ownership, et cetera, et cetera, are lowered, it's not just that people save money and acquire a MacBook more easily, it's that, oh shit, I only needed one MacBook before because the cost of that MacBook was X and the ability to get that MacBook in my house was Y. And those two things together meant that I can only afford 
to have one of them, even though if I really thought about it, I could use three or four of them. Just like 30 or 40 years ago, the average household had one or two TVs in it. And now the average household has three to seven TVs in it. That same rule applies. And so when you think about um, IoT as an example relative to Jevons paradox is that, and it's not, pardon me, it's not apostrophe S. There shouldn't be an apostrophe there. That's my uh, faux pas or maybe um, an autocorrect in uh, PowerPoint. Um, is that as IoT solutions are put in place um, and more, more people use them, the price and complexity of buying and owning IoT devices goes down. As the complexity and cost of IoT devices goes down, people say, well, I couldn't apply IoT to this problem yesterday because the cost of the IoT was more than the value of what the IoT solution would provide me, but now that's changed. So now I've got more solutions to provide IoT to, and that applies to technology across the board. And you don't, even, you don't have to go back very far. You could go back to virtual, virtual machines to containers, or you could go back to tower servers to pizza box servers, or you could go back to mainframes to minis, pick, pick a period. The rule is, is, is the same and it applies. So simple takeaways. And uh, I know we've, we've already run out of time and I apologize. I, I spent much more time on this than I thought I would. Um, but knowing security is great, um, but knowing security in combination with changing customer dynamics is priceless. And so I'm taking a riff a little bit on the credit card commercial, but um, you know, this is really true. And what I've tried to provide you, and I hope I've done an okay job at it. Uh, I really appreciate um, everyone um, uh, listening and, and participating. But what I'm really trying to get across here is that uh, knowing why security is important is great. Knowing security is great, but knowing where people are going with technology, where people are going with their companies, where they're going with products, where they're going with their lives, where other technologies are beginning to expand and take, take hold in society is just as important as actually understanding security. Because now you have a better idea of how to apply it and how to think about applying it and when to apply it. And those are, again, priceless. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for listening. I appreciate being invited. Kirthana, thank you very much. Uh, and I hope this was helpful. Thank you so much, Mark. It was really great. We got a different approach to security from um, your industry experience. Um, do you guys have any questions? Oh, um, I, I do have a question from Priyanka. So what's unique about the product that makes clients come back to you? So Priyanka, I have to, pardon me, I have to ask for a little bit of a clarification. Are you talking about a product in general or are you talking about like the Edgevana product? Uh, um, uh, uh, help me out a little bit, I apologize. Oh, Edgevana. So yeah, there are a few things that, um, that I hope will help bring customers back to me. and. Um, one of those is centered really around customer experience. I, I don't think you can um, ever underestimate um, uh, the value, uh, or oh, excuse me, I don't think you can ever overestimate the value of an incredible customer experience. And so that, that's kind of an underpinning of everything that we do at Edgevana. But beyond that, uh, it was providing something that we felt filled a hole um, in how people were approaching their technology solutions and deployments. And so um, we felt that reducing the barrier to entry, to my point on Jevons paradox earlier, reducing the barrier to entry to accessing and benefiting from global infrastructure, in this case, data centers, networks, access compute, et cetera, would allow people uh, under more circumstances more quickly to deploy the solutions that are important to their companies. And so it's really kind of a combination of uh, product differentiation in the market in combination with um, what we believe will be differentiated customer experience. So Anybody I have a question. Else? Yes, ma'am. Um, so most of the students here are computer science students and um, they're like specializing in software development and stuff. 
And mm -hmm. um, in computer science, leadership is important and computer science is like segueing into business. You need to have like the business um, mindset in computer science. Yep. Uh, and you talked about like security leadership um, and how it's important. Um, is there any job opportunities for these areas, like for security leadership and strategic planning? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, th there, there aren't as many companies that have a role um, like chief st uh, strategy officer or strategic planning uh, as there are companies that have roles for a developer, as an example. But um, these are roles that are um, expanding fairly quickly across industry. And uh, it really boils down to uh, a simple fact that more and more organizations are realizing that um, they, they can't afford to, um, to gut their way forward uh, with, uh, with whatever else they think they should be doing as an enterprise, that they have to take a more strategic um, approach to thinking about their new opportunities. And so, um, and from, a, from a, a kind of a business relationship standpoint for um, uh, comp sci folks in general is that um, the, the market is changing uh, fairly quickly, right? As far as, you know, what, what coding is more, um, what part of the process is more critical? Is it traditional code? Or is it the planner for how the application would actually work um, as a how it's actually coded into function? Um, and so I would say that comp sci is hugely critical um, as a business um, and, and your relationship with business is hugely critical for that reason, along with the, um, the, the idea that uh, understanding um, of business drivers and understanding um, what motivates uh, the business. To my point earlier about uh, potentially putting in security or putting in a disaster avoidance and recovery plan, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are really critical to your being able to be successful with the business because you are part of the business, right? And that's one of the things that is is kind of a dichotomy in the industry is that there's there's it's always IT and then there's the business. Well, why is why isn't it facilities in the business? Why isn't it marketing and the business? Why, why should it be IT and the business? Why isn't it just the business with IT being a function within the business? And technically, the latter is, is true, but the former is what people reference a lot. And, and it may not mean anything to them, but it means something to people that are listening. And so getting to the point where um, you are a business representative, um, you can sit at the, at the C-suite table, you can sit in strategy strategy discussions about the future of the business, product direction, um, how to make your products interact with, um, with people on the street more effectively, et cetera, et cetera. All of those are, are really critical to being able to be successful as opposed to just finding a job. You'll always be able to find a job, right? That a job is a job, but finding an opportunity to really make a difference is up to you and um, a good hiring manager. So what are some, another question just came in from, um, from Mick Jot. Oh, okay, uh, what are some of the competencies students should focus on to build during their career to be at the forefront of digital transformation? Well, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot uh, uh, to, to put in that answer, um, but at a high level, I would say um, you really want, uh, you know, process thinking, um, you want, uh, uh, a mindset that is uh, as much about the humans involved as it is about how process or capabilities can be translated into a tool set or a platform or, or, a, or a given piece of code. Um, but it, it really is, how do I, how do I work with the people um, to make that happen? Right. And, and so it may seem odd, but um, understanding nature, think of um, a, a spy as a bond right, um, uh, or somebody like that. But um, most Spock is actually psychological. And so if you can, if you can get in mind with to, to um, uh, you know, trying to make improvement in the company, then you're much more likely to be able to make those improvements successful because you'll find the ways to get involved and interested in the activity. So if you're a victim 
of a digital transformation activity versus a, a, a protagonist in a, um, a transformation effort. The two are different in the sense that in the first one, where you're a victim, you have somebody top down who said, go digitally transform. And then everybody is like, okay, what does that mean? What is the actual vision? What is it we're supposed to accomplish? Um, how is my job protected? Um, wh why, why is the job I was doing yesterday going to be less important? And how, how, where am I going to be? What's that going to put position? Is that going to put me in? On the other side of the coin, the protagonist is someone who helps and can help lead and can help contribute. And there is a clear vision that is stated and acted upon and lived to by the rest of the executive team within the company. And so if you're in the former, you might want to consider leaving. Um, and, and keep that in mind when you're working in an organization that if you don't have um, people living and breathing what they're saying, then what they're saying is largely meaningless. Do you guys have any other questions? Great. Well, thank you very much, Priyanka. I appreciate the feedback. And uh, Krithana, again, um, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the additional feedback. Thank you very much, folks. And again, you have my contact information there. Um, uh, or if you just like to interact via Twitter or you know, on, on when I post on LinkedIn or something like that, feel free to, to reach out anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. It was a really great presentation. Um, thank you. I've I'll post this on YouTube and then I'll share it with you and everyone else. Thank you so much everyone for attending today and good luck on your midterms and for the rest of the semester. Thank you, Mark. Yes, good luck everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye everyone.